Hi, everyone. My name is Kristen Sieberson. I'm a senior researcher at Microsoft Research New England, and I'm excited to host our panel today on experiments, models, inference, and algorithms. We'll be discussing the importance of thinking jointly about data generation and computational approaches for biology and healthcare applications. I'll have each of our panelists quickly introduce themselves and give a brief summary of their lightning talk. If you haven't had a chance to watch them yet, I encourage you to go back after this discussion and, and watch each one. There are only 10 to 15 minutes long and cover a breadth of topics in this area. Um, so without further ado, let's start with Ava and go around the virtual room. Thanks, Kristen. Hi, everyone. My name is Ava Soleimani. I'm a senior researcher at Microsoft Research New England. And in my talk, I explore how uncertainty in machine learning methods can be used as a bridge to uh, interface experimental and computational work. And I specifically focus on molecular modeling and drug discovery as an exemplary use case for this approach and share how we developed a novel algorithm for uncertainty estimation in deep learning models and applied it in this setting. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Fei Chen. I'm a faculty member at the Broad Institute and also at Harvard. In my talk, I, I talked about some technologies that we're developing in the lab. Um, that are experimental technologies that allow us to bridge genomics with spatial information about tissues. Um, I go into a little bit about uh, how this technology works experimentally, what the data is like, and as well as like the computational approaches uh, and some, some ML-based approaches that we use to uh, extract information about where cell types live and how they interact. Hi, my name is Javron Zahid, and I'm a researcher at Microsoft Research in Redmond. I am working in the immunomics group on the Antigen Map project. We are engaged in a bold collaboration with Adaptive Biotechnologies to try and learn how to read the human immune system. We take next generation sequencing of the T cell repertoire of individuals, and based on that, try to understand uh, and develop diagnostics for diseases they may have and may have had previously. Hi, everyone. My name is Noemi El Haddad. I'm an associate professor in biomedical informatics at Columbia University. And in my talk, I describe a project that we've been doing with endometriosis patients. The issue there is that there's a dearth of data and uh, there's a very large disconnect between what's known clinically and what patients experience. And so we've built, uh, we've done a very long detour to get to collect data that represent the patient's experience and that can be used to be uh, augmenting clinical and surgical data and understand better the disease. Great. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we're so grateful for you taking the time to be here with us today. Um, so to get our conversation started, Ava, I thought that your talk had a really nice summary of the promise of machine learning in, in biomedicine, along with some of the current needs. Um, so I was hoping you could kick off our discussion by summarizing those points here. And um, in all of these conversations, everybody else, please feel free to, to jump in with additional comments. Sure. Yeah. So I think, you know, part of the reason why we're all here today is because we're excited about this possibility for machine learning to really make a transformative impact in biology and healthcare. And I think as we've already started to see that, you know, has been true for a number of different application areas from diagnostics uh, to, you know, personalized health monitoring to therapeutic design to fundamental biological discovery. But I think one of the outstanding challenges that sort of unites and unifies all these different application areas is the fact that in biology, in clinical sciences, there's this really strong link to experimentation and to interfacing with humans who are, you know, in the clinic, at the bench, generating data and putting models and algorithms to the test. And it's that interface that I think brings a lot of particular challenges um, that are still not totally solved and are, are really ripe for opportunity in terms of developing new advances that can sort of accelerate the potential of machine learning for this field. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think we can all definitely agree that like having good data for these problems is, is really key to any project's success. And kind of given that, uh, Noemi, I'm interested to learn a bit more about the history of the app you developed, whether or not at the outset you intended to need to do that much data collection and kind of what experiences you've, you've learned from that that you think might generalize to other um, projects in, in the bio and health spaces. Yeah, I think we we kind of tried to uh, think in a very, you know, we tried to plan this and, and think about what type of experiments would we want to run uh, together with participants, with patients, and think about what type of infrastructure would we want to put together where we could collect data, but also intervene and, and communicate with patients directly, how much, um, how much would we want to ask them, and then the constraints came in in terms of, you know, you can't ask uh, someone, a research participant, for every single thing that is happening in their lives, and so um, then we, we kind of went back to very like basic human computer interaction principles and and thinking of usability of of, of this app uh, and fr user friendliness of the app all the while thinking about um, you know what kind of experimentation and computation we could do about it after but the the big question throughout and until we got to do our uh, you know we collected enough data was like how much of a bias are we introducing when we are asking a participant to self-track and not uh, giving them a, a, strill, a strong schedule of uh, participation or anything like that? It's very much like a regular app that some people are excited to use and others are less, you know, more lenient and less adherent about. And um, and and that was you know always on the forefront in terms of modeling and how would we if we identify this as a bias how would we mitigate it? Yeah, so I guess I'm curious to hear from Faye because you've also been developing technology to gather data, but with a, a clearly very different set of users than uh, Noemi's project. Um, so I don't know if any of the points she was making resonated with you, if you could talk a little bit about how the way you've designed SlideSeek is is different or similar. Yeah, um, I think, you know, thinking about a little bit uh, about just the interplay, the challenges of, of bringing ML to biology is that, you know, we're just getting to the point in biology where we can collect when people think about large data sets in biology, <laughs> I think they're talking about a very different thing than when people usually think about large data in ML. Um, and um, it's only recently with kind of like the super exponential scaling of the cost of sequencing, are we even starting to collect like biological data sets um, I, I think that, that are very amenable to like ML-based approaches, um, at least on, on gene expression and then on, on sequencing. Um, obviously, imaging is another area in biology where we, we do have access to a lot of data, although um, there, you know, there are some caveats there that we can think about as well. But, but, but in general, like, you know, um, one challenge is just collecting the requisite amount of data necessary uh, to, you know, like leverage really good ML-based approaches. Uh, and I, I actually think that we're only just starting to get, get there. And, um, and part of developing technologies, we think about, at least in my lab, we think about like how scalable is the technology and how do we design it to be really like scalable and accessible to a lot of folks. Uh, and also, um, we really like technologies with leverage sequencing readouts because I, I believe that the cost of sequencing is going to continue to decrease, maybe exponentially. And so um, there is another opportunity to start generating data at a different scale. Yeah, so Gibran, my understanding is your project also really leverages sequencing from an, an immunology perspective. I'm curious about how like, you've gotten people excited about that work or engaged with participants in order to build the data sets that, that your analysis leverages. Yeah, I, I think we're in a slightly different regime where I don't think we're currently data limited. Uh, we've been beneficiary of being able to collect data uh, 
for some time now to the point where I think what's limiting us is ideas, uh, our understanding, our fundamental understanding of the biology. Uh, but in terms of um, getting people excited to participate, I would say as an example, uh, what we did, what happened with COVID was a, a watershed moment. We were able to, we built a, a, a diagnostic for COVID uh, based on collaborations with both public, uh, with uh, academic and um, private industry partners, and we're able to use that the urgency of the situation to really push our, our understanding of how we can learn to read the immune system of humans. And so, I think part of it is just the urgency of the situation we're in. Our strategy has been to tackle diseases that are particularly difficult to diagnose. And therefore, we've had lots of partners that are very forthcoming, uh, academic and private. So, no, Noemi, I'm interested to hear then how that's been with your experience, because I am I continue to be surprised with how prevalent endometriosis is. And like, meanwhile, uh, seems relatively understudied. So how has your experience been in engaging participants um, in your work? Yeah, and I, I'm I'm really resonating with what Javran said, which is that when you when you focus on some diseases that are like where there's this clear need uh, and urgency, you definitely you know people respond with more enthusiasm. And I think what we found with endometriosis patients was that they were dying to get heard. And uh, there's this theme in patient communities about like this, you know, having their voices being uh, ignored by the healthcare system and not getting to a diagnosis in time. And so suddenly when a researcher comes and says, we'd love to know everything about you so that we can somehow get you others to get to a diagnosis, it, it really resonated with with people. And, and so we've been we've been feeling very grateful about um about the interest that it that it had and and also why we kind of chose this um this principle of citizen science as a way to present the research to the to the participants and and it worked i think very well in our focus groups with patients um you know we would ask them why would you want to use such an app and and they all had even a persona in mind of like, you know, there's a teenage girl somewhere who's suffering and I don't want her to go through what I went through. And so I think it's, you know, when you have this nice alignment with uh, reasons to participate in science, then it, it becomes uh, easy. Um, where it gets harder and we need to like bring in and keep thinking about like how can technology help us is um, in the type of data we're trying to collect, we want like repeated measures through time. And it's a, it's a lot to ask to any human. I mean, I myself, I don't want to use my app every day, you know, like it's hard to get to stay motivated. And so I think um, then you want to think of other engagement techniques, basically, uh, to, to keep getting the right type of data. Yeah. So I want to move a little bit to kind of a different end of the, the ML pipeline and ask Ava about her experience in developing these uncertainty techniques and kind of given that you're now characterizing the output of a model as opposed to thinking about the data that's input, um, like what do you think are some of the major gaps or importance of that, that part of the pipeline as well? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question. Um, and definitely, I would say at a high level, you know, as we've seen, there's, there's a need to kind of have a link, right, between the data collection and the predictive outputs themselves. But where uncertainty can come in is by, you know, giving the user, the end user, the human, a sense of when the model's predictions may not be able to be trusted. And that's often very, very much linked to the quality of data that, you know, is in a particular um, space, in the sense that we know that machine learning models tend to have poor predictive performance on, you know, out of distribution data um, or data that has not been seen as frequently by the model. And that's going to be associated with a higher metric of predictive uncertainty. And so those two components are very directly linked. And I think where the potential for uncertainty really lies is in being able to give some feedback to the, you know, the biologist, the end user to say, okay, 
here's a region of, the, of our data landscape that is perhaps underrepresented, underexplored. It could be worthwhile to collect more data in this region or to focus experimental efforts you know, on hypotheses that can, can test um, yeah, it can, can test ideas that are relevant to that space. And so there, I think that's uh, really telling as to how uncertainty in particular can try to bridge this divide and link predictions back to data and iterate from there. Yeah, and it sounds like, Noemi, you were tackling some similar potential issues in your work when you were worried about the, the biases that might be introduced by the, the data collection methods. Just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, about your experience in analyzing and then potentially mitigating those effects. Yeah, um, and so, so specifically, you know, in our case, because someone is self-tracking on an app, uh, you know, some might be self-tracking more than others, and there could be an imbalance from one person to the next. Um, we also, in, in a similar type of situations, we're doing predictive modeling on menstrual trackers, uh, which is, again, like some, you know, some individuals tracking a time series, basically, and sometimes forgetting to track that, you know, and so there's this difference between the true state and what we observe, and we are trying to disentangle the two. And so what we found was that, um, you know, we, it, it was very useful to have both for example, in our predictive modeling, have a way of predict um, predicting, for example, next period uh, date, but also have at the same time have a latent variable about that tells us how likely is it that someone is has forgotten to track and and really like explicitly separating these two things uh, from one another. I think the other, you know, the big difference when it comes to like this places where you have control or an ability to interact with the user is uh, very similar to what Ava is saying on, um, you know, we're also looking into, for example, just-in-time intervention, Jedi, like reinforcement learning, where, you know, we know enough about someone's uh, trajectory and we can tell them, here's a thing you could try for your pain or something like that. But we also know that if we don't have uh, enough data, we won't have good predictions. And so having this ability to, to model again, like how much is missing rather than the thing that you're really interested in modeling, which is like, how is your pain? How's your state? You can, uh, you can maybe have an intervention that is about, we really need more data right now. Are you willing to tell us a little bit more um, about what's going on and then move on to, you know, the real prediction later? Yeah, that's really neat. I think the idea of being able to to ask for the data you need is is a pretty novel thing that I haven't haven't seen in a lot of applications. Um, well, well, thinking about uncertainty bias, maybe generalizability kind of fits right in that that category. Gibran, I was impressed in the analysis. You showed how well the model extended across different populations and locations, and I was curious if you felt like the team did anything in particular to to get that result, or if you have any tips on. Um, how to improve generalizability when you have data sets coming from different sources? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things is we were the beneficiary of having a re relatively large data set as far as it goes. Uh, in terms of diseases, we had several thousand individuals that were made up our case set for COVID. And I think that helped significantly. And in fact, early on when we were developing the model, the earlier stages of it, we encountered issues of generalizability, which were directly related to the lack of representation of people of certain genetic backgrounds within our data sets. We had a sample from Padova in Italy, which just didn't work. There was many more false positives than we had seen in other situations in our model in general. And we quickly learned that, you know, it was a consequence of the genetic background variation. And one of the lessons we took away from that is, okay, you may not be able to solve for that problem because we don't have data from all over the globe, but can we at least diagnose it as an issue? And that led to us building some infrastructure uh, that we regularly check now, which genetic backgrounds do we do well for? Um, and so um, I think, you know, that sort of, checking of biases is critical because we're not talking about, you know, figuring out what's, whether something's a cat or a dog, we're talking about human health, right? And so if we're applying these complex models to human health, we better know 
if we're having, uh, we're introducing biases as a consequence of those models. Definitely, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I want to pivot to one other topic. Um, and it's a question for Faye, because I think that one of the exciting promises of biology and health is this ability to integrate many different types of data sets. And you alluded to it at the end of your talk using different sequencing techniques along with side, slide seek and maybe demographic variables or what have you. So I'm curious if you give us a sense of what you think are like some of the major limitations as to why we haven't achieved that and like what some of the future algorithmic needs might be. Yeah, I, I think that's an area of like quite exciting research. Actually, that's a great question. Um, in, in genomics, I mean, we, there's lots and lots of folks working on algorithms which try to integrate many different modalities. Um, and um, in general, um, we've we've had certain success with certain classes of problems, uh, and and basically the the classes the, the types of things that that were successful for are like we we can like regress we can like kind of remove batch effects from data collection right we can if there's like many different um if we're observing the same biological phenomenon but with different modalities of measurement like um you know there's some intrinsic you know underlying like space that cells behave in and we observe it by rna seq or and we observe it by imaging and we observe it by a you know um epigenetic sequencing we're actually becoming quite good at integrating those data sets to like uh, project them on top of each other because like we're learning like different looks at the same amount of like variation in, in the population so so they're like uh you can say integrating like multiple modalities of information um we're actually getting quite good tools for i think um, the challenge is that we have a lot of different data sets where um, you're not exactly looking at the same thing, right? You could have like a lot of like demographic variability in addition, or like genetic variability in addition to kind of um, you know modalities of information, and, and I think that that actually is a pretty outstanding problem. It's hard to integrate those data sets together because. Um, you're not observing some like latent variable uh, across these different modalities. There's actually other sources of variation, and so so. Uh, but I think that would be pretty valuable, right? Like we we can't always collect the same you know genetic background data, you know, from across every different modality or like you know um, or across diseases even, right? So I think that 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 is that is one challenge it would be a great area of test development for, for folks who are interested. Yeah, definitely. I think that type of multi-view learning is an exciting area. Um, well, we're almost out of time. So I wanted to kind of wrap up our discussion by talking about um, advice you might have for people who are excited about this field. I, I imagine a lot of people tuning into our discussion are those who are you know, excited about machine learning and biology and health um, and might be looking for ways to get involved or problems that might be exciting to tackle. So I'm curious if, if you guys could give some, some advice to those folks. Okay, I'll start. Uh, I, I think I, for me, I, I think coming from natural language processing and machine learning, my, my expectation in going into health was like, Experimental data is wonderful, but will not be the answer uh, because we need scale and we need, uh, you know, well, many reasons. And I think like what I, you know, with the years I mellowed a little bit, but I think the advice is that there's there's value to each type of data set. And, and this idea of um, trying to have a holistic view of health cannot be only through observational data set or only through experimental data or only this method or that method and so being a little like soup to nuts in your approach is probably uh the right thing to do to have a, a better understanding of or a better arsenal of tools and techniques and data to answer basic questions one piece of advice I have for anyone doing any machine learning, uh, I think it's a very general, which is, and, and it's especially critical in the context of human health, is that you need to start with simple approaches. Um, the, the key is you have to understand what you're doing. It's quite easy, it quite commonly happens that people have this large data set, they throw a model at it, they get a great prediction out the other side, and then they're happy and they stop, and you just can't do that in human health because there's too much on the line. And you really need to understand what your model's doing. You can't treat it as a black box. So 
really, I think the approach that I've taken is you start with the simplest models and you try to understand the actual mechanisms by which you know the, the model itself is working and how those mechanisms tie to the fundamental science of whatever problem it is you're working on in human health. Yeah, I, oh, okay. I totally agree with Javon's point about always starting with the simplest model. I think in practice for me, this is also a strategy that I regularly employ. Um, I think it's a good, good principle to live by in general for anyone who's doing machine learning. The other thing that I'll add on to that is, so I came from a, a, my PhD, in my PhD training, I did both experimental wet lab work and computational work. And that has been, that has been particularly valuable to sort of understand the day to day, the nitty gritty of what it takes to get stuff done in the wet lab and to build up a technology and move that technology to the point of, you know, being ready to be put into practice in the clinic or used by other researchers. And so I think because of that intimate understanding of what, you know, biological experimentation takes, it's, it's made me have a, a unique perspective and a greater appreciation for where machine learning can fit in and where it's just not yet ready to fit in. And so having that, um, having that perspective has been really valuable. And, you know, I think it's, as we're seeing people come up and in their training at the interface of these two fields, will be really cool to see how, you know, people's trajectories progress and how the field grows as a result of that. Yeah, I was actually going to say something very similar to you. Uh, but I, I, I think it's, uh, you know, I'm an experimentalist. So, and, and I, I think it's actually really valuable when you build, and it's similar to what John said, it's like, when you're building your models, it's really valuable to go back and forth, to iterate, iterate, like, back and forth with people generating the data, right, to get uh, a lot of feedback about both how your model is working and also, like, if, you know, what are, what are the areas where the model is, you know, underperforming, um, and... Also, just getting an intuition for how the data, the structure of the data, and how, how it works, how it's collected. It's not like a you know a black box where the data is just coming out, right? And so, I I think that's actually really valuable uh, and has been valuable for the students that, that have worked at, at that intersection in, in my group. Um, Great, thank you all so much. I really appreciate you taking the time today and uh, discussing these topics with us. Um, definitely looking forward to hearing more about your future work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you nice so to much. meet everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.